this third Sunday after Epiphany, is taken from St. Paul's into the Romans, chapter 12. Brethren, be not wise in your own conceits, evil for evil, providing good things not only in the sight of God, but in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as is in you, have peace with all men. Revenge not yourselves, my dearly beloved. You give place unto wrath, for it is written, Revenge is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But if thine enemy, hungry, enemy be hungry, give him to drink, give him to eat. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in doing this, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome with e by evil, but overcome evil by good. And then the gospel. Take that according to St. Matthew chapter 8. At that time when Jesus was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, the leper came and adored him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, stretching forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will, be thou made clean. And forthwith his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See thou tell no man, but go show, you, go show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And when he had entered into Capernaum, there came to him a centurion besieging him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, and is grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion, making answer, said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man subject to authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to this, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doth it. And Jesus, hearing this, marveled, and said to him, and followed him, And yet I say to you, I have not found so great a faith in Israel. And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into the exterior darkness, where they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go and show thy go, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed at that same hour. That's what the words of today's holy gospel. Here also today, the, 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 the third Sunday after Epiphany, we'll have a consideration not so much on the epistle and gospel of today, but rather on the scripture reading from this morning, which you read in the bravery from the Galatians, St. Paul's of the Galatians chapter 1, and one of the most commonly quoted passages of sacred scripture comes from uh, uh, the saints about what to do in the time of crisis of faith. So this very famous passage which is mentioned in the, in the epistle today, not the epistle, but the scripture reading during the bravery this morning, taking Galatians chapter 1, starting with verse 1. We'll just read the part of it. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and to all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, Grace and peace, uh, grace and peace be to you from God the Father, and from from our, from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us from the wickedness of this present world, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom is glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you to the grace of Christ, changing to another gospel, which is not another gospel, except, the, except in this respect that there are some who trouble you and wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel to you other than that which we have already preached to you, let him be anathema. As I have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preach a gospel to you other than that which we have already received, let him be anathema. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I seeking to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. For I give you to understand, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not of man. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it. But I received it by a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
For you have heard in my former manner of life of Jerusalem, how I betrayed beyond all measure and persecuted the church of God and ravaged it. And I advanced in Judaism above many of my contemporaries in my nation, showing much more zeal for the traditions of my fathers. When it pleased him from my mother's womb, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, immediately without taking counsel of the flesh and blood, and without going up to Jerusalem to those who were appointed apostles before me, I retired to Arabia and again returned to Damascus. And then after three years, I to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the brother of the Lord. Now that I am writing to you there, behold, before God, I do not lie. And so on. In any case, if you consider Asia today, on this very famous passage from St. Paul of the Galatians, so again, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. Amen. If you an angel, if we ourselves, or an angel of heaven, teach you another gospel than the one that we have already preached to you, let them be anathema. This passage we quote so often in any crisis in the Catholic Church. There are many crises in the Church when people walk away from the faith, change something of the doctrine of Christ. And that this doctrine we must reject, any change of doctrine we reject completely. And St. Paul says, if you, you, I am a marvel at you in Galatia. You receive the faith. I preach the faith to you. And then what happens? So soon have you left the preaching of the faith. Now it's interesting that all the many people leave the faith, and they leave for many reasons. The Galatians did not leave because they went back to their false gods. They didn't leave because they turned to impurity and greed and other sins. They left because there were some who troubled you. There were some that came amongst you preaching another gospel and not another gospel. So he says, they came preaching you another gospel and not another gospel, but they perverted the gospel of Christ. So here when our Lord, when St. Paul says, if we ourselves, or an angel from heaven, preach a gospel different than the one we've already preached to you, he's not referring to the Protestants. He's not referring to the pagans, to the non-Catholics. He's referring to men of the Catholic Church who were started by Jesus Christ, followed Jesus Christ, and then they begin to pervert the gospel. They preach another gospel. So he's here speaking precisely and only about those who are followers of Jesus Christ, those who belong to the church, or used to belong to the church, who come and teach a gospel saying they're still following Christ, but they pervert the gospel of Christ. You, you have wandered away because of these, says St. Paul. And that, and that, and that's what he says. Point again says it twice. I marvel that you are so quickly departing, deserting from Him who called you to the grace of Christ, changing to another gospel, which is not another gospel, except in this respect that there are some who trouble you, who wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, that is Saint Paul himself, if we, an angel from heaven, should preach the gospel to you other than the one which we have already preached to you, let him be anathema. Then the second statement, as I have said before, so we say again. If anyone preach a gospel to you, other than that which you have received, let him be anathema. And the second part of the verse has been pointed out by many of the saints, especially St. Pius X in the last century, and saints throughout the last 2,000 years. The first verse, if we ourselves, or an angel from heaven, which means a bishop of the church, preach to you a gospel other than what we've already preached, let him be anathema. And as we said before, so we say again, if we, if anyone preach a gospel different than the one that you have already received, here as St. Pius X says, and, and so many of the other fathers of the church and doctors before him say, well, how can we know? What is this statement? This statement has no meaning unless you can know what you were taught. We have to know that we were preached a gospel, and this is the basic catechism. St. Pius X wrote ten encyclicals between 1903 when he became Pope and 1914 when he died, a little more than ten years. He wrote ten encyclicals and documents and bulls and so on on catechism, catechism, and catechism. But we have to know what we have been taught. And also, it doesn't matter how old the priest is, if we ourselves are an angel from heaven, so you got a young priest, 23, 24 years old, newly ordained, and he preaches his first sermon. It's not his first sermon. 
But it goes to the priest, preaches in the pulpit, he preaches as priest. And he's supposed to be preaching what priests have preached, since St. Paul preached as a priest, preached as a priest. And since St. Peter preached as a priest, they all preach the gospel. Remember what, what, what St. Paul said to the Romans in chapter 10. Fides ex auditu. Faith comes by hearing, but how can there be a hearing unless there are preachers? And how can there be preachers unless they be sent? The preachers are sent by God, and even though this young man is a priest for one day, one week, one month, he's preaching his first sermon, they say when a priest works his first sermon because of how nervous he is, he's allowed seven heresies. But the fact is that he must not preach any heresies. So when there are seven, when the new priest preaches, it doesn't matter if he's 24 years old. You must never hear from him another doctrine than the one that came from the priest. When he speaks as a priest, therefore St. Paul says, if we ourselves or any other, uh, or an angel from heaven, angel means messenger, referring, of course, metaphorically to the angels themselves, but actually to the bishops who are the messengers of Christ and the successors of the apostles. That we ourselves or an angel of heaven preach you another gospel. When he says another gospel, he made it clear beforehand, he's not saying priests who say, join the Muslims. Priests who say, join the animists. We're not referring to priests who have become so corrupted that they say, become basically pagan and worship nature and go to any false religion. We're discussing priests who say they believe in Jesus Christ, who claim to be following his teaching, but are teaching another gospel. These are priests like Arius, and like Martin Luther, and, and uh, John Calvin. And these priests of God that have turned away from God to preach another gospel. And they said they were still priests, and they said they were still teaching the truth. And they preach another gospel. But then St. Paul says, "If it, I say again, if anyone preaches a gospel other than the one that you have already received. This is a reminder to every Catholic that they have an obligation, a very grave obligation to know their faith. We have to know our faith. If I don't know the basic catechism, who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? God made me to show forth his goodness and to know me and so that I might know, love, and serve him in this world to be happy with him in the next. I have to know that. What do we mean when we say that? What, is, what, what do we mean when we say the Catholic Church is one? When we say the Church is one, we mean that it has one faith, one sacrifice, one set of sacraments, united under one head, who is the Holy Father. And if we don't know that what, the, what it means that the Church is one, if someone tells me a different faith, a different sacrifice, new kinds of sacraments, then how am I going to know that I'm hearing something different? We have to know what we have heard. And then we have to make sure that we don't ever hear anything different. When you prepare for your first Holy Communion, you learn about the Sacrament of Confession, your Sacrament of Penance. And the best definition is the one given to the little St. Joseph Catechism. What is it? That, how, what do you need to do to prepare for a confession? I need to do five things to prepare for a good confession. Number one, I must find out my sins. I must be sorry for my sins. I must make up my mind not to sin again. I must tell my sins to the priest, and I must do the penance the priest tells me. And these are the five things necessary for confession. Like I mentioned in an earlier sermon, and when the seminarians go to the seminary and they learn their Catholic theology, learn moral theology, there's still five things needed for confession. It doesn't change. You still have to do an examination of conscience to find out your sins. You still have to make a firm purpose of amendment and make up your mind not to sin again. You still have to tell your sins to the priest. You still have to do the penance the priest tells you. We still must know the five things. And it never becomes six. And it never becomes four. And so it is with the seven, seven um, uh, virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and prudence, justice, and fortitude. And the seven sacraments and the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. We must know these things when we're little. We must memorize these things. And if we hear another gospel, is there salvation outside of the Catholic Church? Is there salvation outside of Jesus Christ? No, there is not. Or it said, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathers not with me scatters. He that hears you hears me. He said his faith, and we are supposed to know it. And therefore, if someone comes and preaches to me another gospel, 
Let him be anathema. Let him be anathema. Let him be anathema. One example of this in our times, an error of Vatican II, after Vatican II, for traditional Catholics, well, many traditional Catholics fall into this error, is called the error of Sedevicantism, where they believe that we don't have a Pope anymore. And Father Edward Donald said it very well when he said, Sedevicantism is just another Novus Ordo novelty. Just another novelty of Vatican II. Because there has never, ever been a time in the history of the Church where there's been no Pope. From St. Peter all the way up until 2021, there's been Pope after Pope after Pope after Pope after Pope. The 263 and 264 Popes. One after another. We have all their bodies. We know their, when they began their reign, when they ended their reign, where, and what their nature of death was, and they ruled the Church. And the, following, and the doctrine of the Church says there will be perpetual successes of Peter until the end of time. But now we say, well, the last Popes are very bad. There have been bad Popes before. And therefore, there's no Pope. Was there ever a time when there's no Pope before? Maybe it makes a lot of sense. Maybe it's very reasonable. Maybe it seems to be to many souls. But it is different than what we've been taught before. We have been taught that our Lord Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of St. Matthew, Thou art Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. In the case of all, I will rebel against it. And I will remain with you until the consummation of the world. The gates of hell will never prevail against it. He will be with us to the consummation of the world. That his divine constitution of the church shall remain until the consummation of the world. So it was that way 2,000 years ago. It will be that way when the Antichrist comes and St. And Peter II, the final pope, reigns. It will be that way always. There will never be a new doctrine. There will never be a new situation. And this is a crisis of that. And there, but we have to know what the doctrine of the church is. We have to know what it is, and then we can recognize that there has been a new doctrine. And so Saint Paul says, and also Saint Paul in Galatians chapter one points out that he is an apostle. He said, "I spent fifteen days with Saint Peter. I met Saint James once and talked to him for a few minutes." I never even laid eyes on any of the other ten apostles. I never saw them, would recognize them if I did see them. I did not learn my 15 days of St. Peter about Christ. I didn't learn from St. James. I learned directly from revelation by Jesus Christ himself in three years spending the desert in Arabia, in a place called Felix Arabia, Happy Arabia. There he was for three years. And he spoke with Christ every day, and he is an apostle who learned directly from God. And what he says in his 14 epistles are directly from Jesus Christ. They're not from what he heard from Peter and James and John's and Thomas and James and Philip and and so on. He learned from Jesus Christ himself. And he says, I spent three years in the desert, and after the three years I came back and talked to St. Peter. And this is important, because during those 15 days, Peter would have cross-examined St. Paul. You, you, were, you were blind. You were knocked off your horse. You, you got cured by Ananias. You then went to the desert for three years. Now you come back and you want to be a preacher of the gospel of Christ? What do you know? And during those 15 days, St. Peter would have found out that he knew just as much as Peter. And that he was with Jesus Christ during those three years. And that he was a true apostle. And therefore, Peter did not in any way prevent St. Paul from preaching. And they immediately became twin apostles. Because Peter's relationship with Christ and how he interacted with him was so similar to St. Paul's relationship with Christ and how he interacted, and both of them spent three years with Christ. So Peter spent no more time with Christ than St. Paul. And they became twin apostles, and God arranged that they would both die on the same day and be martyrs on the same day, and in the same city of Rome, St. Paul, his head cut off, and St. Peter crucified upside down on the same day in 64 AD, 31 years after the crucifixion. And St. Paul says, is there, if we ourselves or an angel of heaven teach you another gospel, we must know what the gospel is. We must know what the teaching is, and we don't mix and match the gospel. We can't take the gospel and mix it with the modernists of Vatican II. We can't take the gospel and mix it with heresies of Protestantism and other errors. We can't mix the gospel with the schismatics. The gospel must be kept sane and clear and bold and straight. And it's the same gospel that it's always been. And right now there's a great temptation that many people are getting together, united only in the Latin Mass, united only in the fact that we are against the modernists. But also another note, as I mentioned earlier, I meant to mention at the beginning of the sermon, also forgot to at this time as well, and that is 
We now have a new president. Today is the 24th of January, four days ago, Joe Biden became the president of the United States. Now what does that mean? Was he validly elected? Many people talk about the state of Ecantism, well the Pope wasn't validly elected. Was Joe Biden validly elected? Absolutely not. Was he put into power by the will of the people? No, he was not. He stole the election. He, was, he used the, the, the enemies of God and the enemies of our country and the enemies of democracy to become president. It is now the 24th of January. And for the last four days, he is the president. And Trump is not. Trump went out. He could have fought the presidency of Biden, but he did not. He went out. Joe Biden is the president. Is he a worthy president? Absolutely not. Now what are our obligations towards him? When Easter comes on Good Friday, we're going to sing the office of Good Friday. The Mass of Good Friday. The Mass of Resanctified. There's no consecration of that Mass. We call it a Mass. And on that Good Friday, we're going to sing at the altar, O Ramos Pro Joe Biden. There is going to be a prayer for him. And it's going to be because he does have authority over America as a representative of God. He has no authority for the people. And if anyone thought he did have authority for the people, that should be that foolishness should be wiped away by the present election. He was not elected by the people, but guess what? He's the dude in charge. So likewise, the man that walked out on the balcony in 2013 and said and, and, and was not able to give the sign of the cross, it was too hard for him. But he was able to give a wave, and he asked the blessing of the people for the Pope, instead of giving the blessing of the Pope to the people. My father here goes to say, did you remember to give the Pope your blessing? Did you remember to give the Pope your blessing? He forgot to give a blessing to the people. He asked for the people's blessing. But he came out and he said his name was Francis, and he is the Bishop of Rome. Therefore, he is the Pope. He is a wicked Pope. He does not love God. He is not following the faith. He is an enemy of God. But he is the Holy Father, and he has authority from God, and he has chosen to use his authority against God. But the time will come when he is going to be fine. Don't worry. The time will come when he will be fine. He will, he will meet the judgment of God. He is the Pope. He is the Holy Father. Just like Joe Biden is the President. He wish he wasn't, but he is. And that also means he must receive the respect of a President. We have a famous martyrdom of, of Margaret Clitheroe, who was killed in the reign of Elizabeth, the Queen of England, who was really evil, who was much worse than Joe Biden. Joe Biden is just a cheap politician. That's all he is. But she was extremely evil. And she brought about the death of many, many, many saints in England. And one of them was a mother about to have a baby. She was pregnant, Margaret Clitheroe, and she was put to death. Her husband was away or at some other place, and she protected a priest from being captured. But she, he got away, but she was caught. And they killed her because of the faith. And they said to her, Margaret, you are a bad citizen of the queen. You do not respect and you don't honor Queen Elizabeth. And she said, I do respect. I do honor Queen Elizabeth. And I would never go against the queen. I will never disobey any of her legitimate commands. I would never wish any harm upon her. But God is more important than the queen. And they have said, you will therefore be put to death. I am glad to put me go to death, but I will never be against the queen. And she was not against the queen, because as a queen of England, she was a representative of God. And she had no authority to do the wickedness that she did. And she respected, Margaret Clitheroe respected her as Queen Elizabeth as queen, and we respect Biden as president. He must repent. He must turn back to God. He is the president. He is just wicked, and he is simply following those who control him. And as of January 20th, 2021, the United States is now officially a communist country, ruled by a communist dictatorship. It's no longer a republic or a democracy. It is now a communist country, and there's no point in calling it by its former name. The United States of America, as a republic and as a democracy, is dead. It died on January 20th, 2021. However, the wicked man that took over the authority and is called president 
He does have authority from God, as every other leader of countries has authority from God. Joseph Stalin had authority from God, a most wicked man. And he was judged as a leader of a country who used his, his, his leadership to bring about millions and millions and millions and millions of murders. Biden envies Stalin. He wants to murder more than Stalin was able to get. He will try to murder them by the wicked laws of, the, of, the, of this, these vaccines and other laws that are going to come down the line to cause grave harm to our people and to kill them. But he is the President of the United States. We pray for his repentance. We pray for his coming back to God and that he must return to God if as wicked as he is. And so we must understand that in our battle, God is God, and he is completely in charge, and the faith is the faith, and we have had our ancestors under wicked kings for the last 2,000 years. We have had the practice of faith in catacombs, in private homes, in the streets, in prisons, and our faith has survived every single wicked nation, in every single wicked kingdom, in every single wicked age, and the faith will survive this age. Hence, the primary duty is, Tradivi quorera chepi, which St. Paul would say at the end of his life. I have handed down that which I have received. And the grace in God is not, or God was not void in St. Paul, and it must not be void in us. We must take the same gospel given to us by our ancestors, given to us by 2,000 years of teaching and tradition, handed down to our children. That's our primary duty. And let the murderers be murderers. Let the wicked kings be wicked kings. Let the wicked soldiers be wicked soldiers, let the wicked bishops be wicked bishops, and the wicked popes be wicked popes, and wicked priests be wicked priests, and wicked faithful be wicked faithful, and wicked pagans be wicked pagans all they want. We hold firm to the faith, and all their wickedness shall be buried in hell, all their wickedness shall be forgotten, it shall pass. And that no, nothing evil lasts. Only true and only good lasts. This faith has been handed down for 2,000 years. It's here now in the church. We will remain here. It's not going to go away. Let us remember that if we hear the gospel preached by anyone other than the one we have received, the one that we should know from our little catechism, then let them be anathema. Let them be anathema does not mean he's not the king. Doesn't mean he's not the pope. Doesn't mean he's not a bishop. Doesn't mean he's not a priest. Doesn't mean he's not a king or Catholic. It simply means go to hell. That's what it means. And exactly when you're mad at someone and you say, go to hell, that means you don't want it. you don't believe anything they have to say, you don't accept what they say, you reject them, let them be anathema, let them be condemned, let them go to hell. But you don't stop them from being king. You don't stop them from being priest. You don't stop them from being bishop. You don't stop them from being pope. You don't stop them from being alive. And if they repent, they will no longer be anathema. And if they don't repent, they shall actually go to hell. So it's a very conditional statement. Go to hell. And if they don't repent, that's where they're going. And if they do repent, then they no longer need to be anathema and they won't go to hell. So let them be anathema it means the same thing back then as it means now. When we say to someone, get lost or go to hell, it only means I reject everything you say, I reject everything you do, I will not accept any of your errors or any of your moral evils. I won't accept accept them. Let them be anathema. I cut myself off from you and the things that you do, but I don't stop you from being what you are. There have been wicked popes, wicked bishops, wicked priests, wicked deacons, wicked faithful, wicked nuns, wicked monks, and there will be wicked people of all types throughout until the very ending of time. And our Lord Jesus Christ prophesied that it would be that way in the Holy Gospel. And so we stand firm in our faith, and our faith will conquer their wickedness. Many of these wicked souls shall repent. Others shall be condemned, and the faith shall continue throughout, without any exception in any age. The faith will continue. Let's carry the faith through our age, and ask the grace of the strength of our ancestors who had to deal with wicked kings and wicked laws before, and they kept their faith. So may we also do the same as our ancestors did, and persevere in the gospel handed down to us, and handed down to our children and children's children, to the third and fourth generation, so the faith continues all the way till the end of time, and that we be instruments to help it to continue. So I bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.